Hello, my name is Lauren Layfield and this is Your Next Podcast, the show that podcast fans everywhere have been waiting for. The podcast I'd love you to listen to this week is Normal Women from HarperCollins with the author Philippa Gregory. It's based on her amazing book of the same name and basically retells history from the perspective of women. It talks about the idea of women as angels, the gender pay gap through the centuries, sex, strength, rape and the subject of episode one, Riot. That's the women's lib demonstration which dramatically disrupted the Miss World beauty competition in 1970. That's the women's peace camp at Greenham Common in 1982, protesting cruise missiles. That's women who gathered to mourn for the death of Sarah Everard and found themselves being cleared away by police who said it was an illegal demonstration just two years ago. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! That's the sound of women nurses on the street in London calling for better pay in 2023. These are all women breaking the unspoken rule that women don't take to the streets, confront authority, loot or rampage. Women are rarely named as the leaders of riots and rebellions, but this is a gap in history. Not the absence of women. Men of the streets! Men of the streets! I'm Philippa Gregory, and my new book, Normal Women, looks at nine centuries of women's history in England, from the Norman Conquest in 1066 till the present day. I'm interested not just in the famous heroines that we all know, but the women we don't know, everyday lives of normal women. And today we're going to look at the sometimes anonymous, often unknown women who've been at the forefront of demanding change. They've been so loud, so strident, and so successful that critics accuse them of being unruly or even criminal, and their demonstrations from medieval food riots to industrial strikes and peace camps and vigils were named as riots. Later, I'll be talking to a woman radical herself, the historian Sheila Rowbottom, and a woman who shocked the nation with her report on the Metropolitan Police, Dame Louise Casey. But right now, let's dive into this episode of Normal Women. Normal Women Riot. Let's start with one of the earliest known riots, actually a revolution, the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. Now at school, we learn that people rose up under a leader, Watt Tyler, in a protest against new taxes. But the bit that's almost always missing is who was being taxed. The new tax was actually a tax on wives. For the first time ever, married women were to be taxed separately, not included in their husband's tax. It was a tax on women. Women who had no legal rights, no name in law, no way of being heard in the men-only courts and parliament. And it was those women who rose up. The revolt goes down in history as the Watt Tyler Rebellion. But really, it should be called the Joan Hancock and Agnes Jenkin Rebellion because it was those two women who started the riot in Canterbury and were thought to be so dangerous that they were arrested and chained up in the castle. What Tyler enters the story when he leads a mob to break them out of Canterbury Castle and the three revolutionaries lead the rebels of Kent to London. In Maidstone, the very next day, the jail was torn down by another woman, Julia Poucher. Five days later, with the rebels actually inside the walls of London, there's yet another woman, Joanna Ferrault, leading rioters to the Savoy Palace, the beautiful riverside home of the young king's uncle, John, Duke of Gaunt. Two London women were among the rioters at the palace, Matilda Brembol and her daughter, Isabella. And we actually have a report of what the mother and daughter did at the palace. Listen to this. They 
tore to pieces cloth of gold and silver and rich tapestries, broke up the rich furniture, crushed the Duke's plate, and ground his jewels and precious stones underfoot. All that could not be destroyed was thrown into the river. When the work of destruction was over, the Savoy lay a smouldering ruin. Joanna Farrar loaded a boat with stolen gold from the Savoy Palace and rowed across the river to Southwark, where she divided the hall between herself and the other rebels. But Matilda and Isabella Bremble go on. They led rioters to the fabulously wealthy Priory of Clerkenwell, the major priory of the Knights Hospitallers, and they sacked and fired that too. And there's yet another woman leader, Catherine Gammon, on the quayside when the Chief Justice Cavendish comes running down trying to get to his boat to get away from the mob. Judge Cavendish was one of the most hated men in England, known for his corruption. He was the man who set the wife tax. The mob was at his heels as he dashed towards his boat, and when Catherine Gammon saw him, she coolly set his boat adrift into the river. The mob caught him and beheaded him on the spot. Next day, while Watt Tyler met the young King Richard II for peace talks, Johanna Farrar, the leader of the Savoy Palace riot, marched at the head of rebels to the Tower of London and pulled the Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury, and the Lord High Treasurer, Robert Hales, out of hiding. And again, there's an eyewitness report. She went as the chief leader to the Tower of London and she laid violent hands on Simon, recently Archbishop of Canterbury, and then on brother Robert Hales. And she dragged them out of the tower and ordered that they be beheaded. Meanwhile, what Tyler thinks he's got a deal, King Richard promised to suspend the tax and end serfdom. But a scuffle broke out, or maybe it's a betrayal, and Tyler was killed. The London militia dispersed the rebels, the king's advisers reclaimed the city, and, this won't surprise you, the young king broke the promises he made to the rebels. And that's where the story usually ends, with the death of the male leader, Watt Tyler. But actually, there was much, much more. There were protests and riots all around the country, from East Anglia to Yorkshire, often led by women. The tax was silently dropped and the rules of serfdom slowly forgotten. It was a hidden victory for unknown women. One uprising in Cambridge directed against John of Gaunt's college, Corpus Christi, was led by an old woman, Margaret Starr. The rebels broke into the colleges and seized the charters and letters patent and set fire to them in the marketplace and Margaret Starr flung the ashes into the air we have a record of her crying out, away with the learning of Clarks, away with it. With me for this episode of Normal Women is the trailblazing feminist historian Sheila Rowbottom and the inspiring public servant Dame Louise Casey, author of the recent review into London's Metropolitan Police. Sheila, for sure the learning of Clarks that Margaret Starr cursed did not include the history of women. Not then, and not later. I mean, I'm just thinking as you speak how I studied medieval history as an undergraduate and I hardly touched on a position of women. And then later on, um, because I got interested in women's history because of the women's liberation movement, I, I began to look... And although I've never specialised in medieval history, I realise that there were these really formidable women, including learned women as well as the rioters. Your great book with the fabulous title, Hidden from History, it was an inspiration to me when I first read it back in the 80s. And I followed you in looking for the hidden women of history. And I found highway women and she soldiers, shepherdesses and inventors. And again and again, I came across riots and demonstrations very often led by women. Almost every riot for food is led by women, and most of the crowd is always women. If there's ever such a thing as women's work, you could say it's the food riot. I think it could bring men out as well, obviously. But because women are responsible for 
feeding people, they're going to notice that there's nothing to put on the table in a way that is very immediate. And I think there was a sense, uh, I I don't know from Britain, but in, in the French Revolution, women actually say, to the authorities who are saying, you know, we're going to um, come back in three days because we, the assembly isn't meeting. They say we wouldn't tell our children to wait three days when they come to us and say mm. that they need food. Mm. So there's that feeling that women are responsible for meeting needs, mm. and that can go into a, a public sphere rather than simply the private sphere of the family. Mm. Mm, And there's that really interesting loophole in the law. For women before the 18th century, there's a belief from the judges to the poorest people that women have no official position in the law of the land, and so a woman can't be convicted for anything less than murder. She doesn't really exist in law. Her husband or her father are legally responsible for her. Louise, do you think there's a sense that women are still invisible to the law today? Well, I think despite the change, uh, having the vote, things like that, despite all of that, I think women are invisible in terms of people don't hear them, they don't see them, and they don't listen to them, uh, even if they get up the courage to say they're a victim of crime. They're often not heard. Um, So in an odd kind of way, I almost think that's disenfranchisement of a worse order because we're pretending that we're taking women seriously and we're we're talking about it a lot and, you know, all the rest of it. And yet, actually, when you think about it in the present day, you know, women are subservient. They don't complain <laughs> on the whole. And if they are a victim of crime, which is a terrible thing, often sexual or violent sexual assault and abuse, the system doesn't hear them. It's really shocking to think that women were more visible and heard in the medieval period when they've got no legal rights at all than now. But I think you're right. In the medieval world, people used their invisibility to demonstrate even riot and get away with it. And some riots, it looks as if the men step back and let the women challenge the authorities because everyone knows that women won't be arrested short of murder. It's a way of bargaining when you haven't got a formal structure. And there's no institutional framework of trade unions for, you know, women in the crowd. The crowd action becomes a way of putting pressure on the authorities. And it's a a very risky one, obviously, for the people who participate because they could have very severe penalties. But it's something that it can work. And I guess when people are pushed to such extremity of need... They're going to feel that they have to take risks because the the alternative is actually worse. Yes. Yeah, we see it in the history. A food riot only starts in the really hungry areas when other appeals have failed. For instance, typically the first event would be in the local market with women just demanding that local food be sold locally at the usual price. And only if the merchants refused, then women would take direct action. They might capture wagons or or break into grain stores, weigh out the grain themselves, and they often paid. It wasn't just theft or looting. They paid what they thought was a fair price. And quite often, the riot was ended by a local authority, usually the justice of the peace, the magistrate, coming into the marketplace, weighing the food himself and setting a fair price, actually agreeing with the women's action, giving them what they wanted. The women get their own way. And I want to take a look now at a particular example of this at Malden, Essex, in 1629. It's been studied by historians of crowd action, but it doesn't make it into most of the history books. But it was an extraordinary riot, which went from the poor women right the way up to the Privy Council, so successful that the government of the time changed their policy and banned merchants from shipping food out of the hungry areas to increase their profits. Because this was thought to be so serious, the report went to the Privy Council so we know what the women rioters actually said. It's so rare to hear the voices of poor women, but the magistrates reported them and their names. First, 
the magistrates reported that the rioters were trying to get hold of weapons, muskets, and were threatening to kill farmers or any other factors employed to buy or sell any corn. Poor women laborers, wives of laborers or craftsmen marched with their children to the quayside where several grain ships were being loaded. They boarded the ships, they filled their bonnets and their aprons with rye to take away to mill and to flour for bread. The women claimed they were not under the law. Women are lawless and not subject to the laws of the realm as men are, but might offend without dread or punishment of the law. One of the rioting women was Anne Carter, who had been the wife of a prosperous butcher, mistress of her own house, employing two servants only the previous year. When the slump in the cloth trade happened, she and her husband lost their business and their family home, and Anne Carter was thrown into poverty. Another rioting woman was Elizabeth Sturgeon, a labourer's wife, who said she was in poverty and wanting victual for my children. And Spearman, a day labourer, said she went to steal rye from the ships because she couldn't have corn in the market because Flemish ships at Burrow Hills are there to carry the corn away beyond sea. Margaret Williams told magistrates that she went to the ships. Amongst others of my own accord, corn being dear and being carried away and me being a poor woman. One woman was asked who had incited her to riot and she answered, The cry of the country and my own want. The cry of the country and her own want. Only a few of the rioters were arrested and they were not accused or convicted of any crime, but only bound over to keep the peace. Anne Carter denied leading the riot, and she too was bound over. The local magistrates searched the grain ships for other food that was needed locally, bacon, cheese and butter, and the leading townsmen, bailiffs, aldermen and head burgesses, agreed to buy the corn at their own expense and sell it at an agreed price to the poor. You see... The riot was completely successful. It escalated in clear stages that everyone perfectly understood. An early threat of violence was followed by non-violent direct action by women. The magistrates supported the women's action and the townsmen set a fair price for the food or sold or gave it to the women. But the merchants' greed for money undermined the agreement. And only three months later, there were more ships loading grain at Malden. And this time, Anne Carter, the butcher's wife, came out openly to lead the rioters. And as merchants went on shipping corn out of hungry areas, forcing up prices, she travelled round the clothing townships to drum up support. And she sent out letters. And she signed herself as captain. Come, my brave lads of Malden. I will be your leader, for we will not starve. As many as 300 men and women, unemployed cloth workers, boarded a ship, attacked the crew, stole the cargo and forced the ship to sail away empty. Another group of rioters broke open a warehouse and carried off more grain. They assaulted the leading merchant, Mr Gamble, and made him give them £20. He called the magistrates and the crowd melted away as the JPs arrived. The Privy Council set up a special court to try the rioters for a crime that they described as being of so high a nature and of so dangerous consequence that it amounteth to little less than a rebellion. Anne Carter, the butcher's wife who had fallen into poverty, who dared to call herself captain, was hanged. Four rioters charged with taking away 15 quarts of rye grain were hanged as well. But the riot that she had summoned forced the Essex magistrates to bring in grain and sell it to the poor at less than the market price, and special care was taken to see that Malden and the clothing towns didn't go hungry again. It's extraordinary to me that in the 17th century, the women of Malden call a riot and they're heard. They get food at affordable prices, and yet in England today, with soaring prices, there are hungry people again. Louise, you worked with troubled families. You must see history repeating itself. 
I fail to understand in 2023 that we've got about 11 million people in a population of 70 million. So many of those families can't put food on the table without going to a food bank or some other such place, community kitchen, whatever it is. And nobody's rioting. You know, nobody riots. I've spent a lot of time now since COVID thinking how dire things are and how unbelievably tolerant people are to that direness. It's like they almost feel that they deserve it and that women deserve it. So women are ashamed. You you meet them at, the, you know, I, I took some sort of bags out to a woman whose friend had given her a lift to the food bank. And only there did she say something to me because I was helping her drop the bags in her friend's boot because she felt too ashamed inside the actual food bank to admit she was even there because she feels a failure. So so it's not turned into anger. Do you see what I mean? It, it's turned into shame and personal failure, which it's not their personal failure. We've made a choice in this country about how we're going to support families and we continue to make those choices every single hour of every day and their political choices, which we could change. Yeah, and you can see at Malden in 1629 how policy can turn on a sixpence. One day the Privy Council understands that hunger is making women riot, and then they take action to keep food local. And then three months later they decide that the riot is too much for them to tolerate. Sheila, in your own life of radicalism, have you seen attitudes change? It is the 80s, I think. Mm. There was a, a very successful turnaround to make people feel that they were guilty and responsible for their own predicament if they were poor, mm. and that, that to be poor was um, a despicable thing to be rather than to be rich. I don't remember that being something that was really, I mean, it was present in the capitalist culture, but it wasn't total in the, even, you know, in the 1970s and 60s when I was becoming. In, uh, involved as an adult in um, uh, left politics. It gets very harsh. In the 18th century, the mood between the poor and the gentry really seems to change. Partly, it's because there are so very many riots. There's a real crackdown in 1771. For the first time, lawyers announce that women are legally responsible. They're not going to let them off anymore. The law doesn't change. The legal experts just say that women shouldn't be treated as if their husbands or fathers are responsible for them. So it's equality, but not in a good way. You know, it doesn't give us any advantages. And as poor people radicalise, the gentry gets more severe and the whole conflict escalates. The authorities start to get an idea that a public demonstration itself is a dangerous thing and it has to be put down or better still, prevented. Sheila, I know it's a huge question, but do you think there's a change then at the end of the 18th century coming into the 19th century in the way that the gentry view and treat working-class people, especially when they're protesting? I don't know enough about how the you know all of the gentry would be, but there's definitely that new fear because of the French Revolution and the fact that there had been successful action by people in the crowd in France. And therefore, um, I think that they probably feel they're on a kind of knife edge. And therefore, they would be, because of that fear, probably more likely to, to be overtly oppressive. Whereas before, they can govern by this kind of super superiority, which is taken for granted and acceptable. I think that People must have begun to think, well, you know, they have actually done this. It radicalises both ends of the classes, both the working people who want more out of their lives, but it also radicalises the gentry who become that bit more defensive. Yes, and also, of course, a few of the people from the upper strata became began to question the legitimacy of their position. It's really interesting. I was just reflecting then about what you said, I think, Philippa, about both ends sort of toughen up. And what we saw in the 2011 riots were the sort of upper classes, for want of a better world, the people with the power, come out so 
viscerally about people that were looting, largely who were not the same skin colour as them, and and therefore there was a race element to some of that. And it's just very striking that there's something about rioting that the that we all find deeply disturbing because, of course, the order of things is so thrown. Yes. Absolutely. I think in the 18th century, it's the start of an acute class consciousness. So much happens, industrialization and radical thinking, and a gulf opens up between the haves and the have-nots. And the riot act comes in so that the magistrate who used to come out and distribute food, they now come out to clear the streets of protesters. They don't even talk to them. They just read the act and everyone has to go home or the militia can open fire. And it's the riot act that allowed the militia to ride through a peaceful demonstration for the vote at the notorious Peterloo Fields massacre outside Manchester. The magistrate called out the local militia on horseback and they target women in the crowd. There are witness reports of Peterloo, really terrible description, by the radical supporter Richard Carlyle. The women appear to have been the particular objects of the cavalry assassins. One woman who was near the spot where I stood and who held an infant in her arms was sabred over the head and her tender offspring drenched in her mother's blood. Another was actually stabbed in the neck with the point of a saber, which must have been a deliberate attempt on the part of the military assassin. Some were sabred in the breast. So inhuman, indiscriminate and fiendlike was the conduct of the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry. I mean, here you have the gentry using local soldiers, local men, to target non-violent working-class people who are doing nothing worse than holding a meeting to demand the vote, and they especially targeted women. I suspect that they themselves as men were particularly horrified mm. to see women being sort of double rebels. I mean, they were rebelling politically and they were rebelling against the the accepted view of how women should be in the eyes of these um, military people. Coming up, we delve further into the pages of my book, Normal Women, to find out about the Bryant and May workers, their famous match women's strike, the women of Greenham Common and the beauty parade. That's all to come on Normal Women Riot. I'm Philippa Gregory. This is Normal Women Riot. With me today are the historian Sheila Rowbottom and Baroness Louise Casey, who was the country's first victims commissioner and author of a recent report into London's Metropolitan Police Force. Before we talk, I want to turn to women's protests in the 19th century. Women had long lost the battle to defend their families against hunger and far away lost the battle to defend their fields against landlords, enclosing them for gardens, hunting parks and arable fields. Women found themselves looking for work in the growing cities where there was widespread poverty, where they couldn't join together in protest as their mothers and grandmothers had done. They weren't even able to insist that landlords provide clean water and decent housing. But they were starting to organize themselves as workers and calling for the vote. One of the early women's strikes was at Brian and May Match Factory, where factory girls were dying of fossy jaw, which was poisoning from the phosphorus matches. The appalling lives of these women workers were reported by the campaigning journalist Annie Besant in a furious tirade in the radical newspaper The Link in 1888. Do you know that the women and girls whose labour made the 22.5% dividend paid in February last are living or dying in Old Ford, Bromley, Tiger Bay and other districts of East London on wages, varying from four shillings to about 13 shillings a week? Pass the wages. Do you know that these female hands eat their food in the rooms which they work, so that the fumes of the phosphorus mix with their poor meal and they eat disease as seasoning to their bread? The phosphorus poison works on them as they chew their food and rots away the bone. Your foremen have sharp eyes. If they see a girl's face swell, they know the sign. 
and she is sent off and gets no pay during her absence. Past the poisoning, do you know that these white slaves of yours are fined? A system of devilish ingenuity catches them in endless traps and robs them of the poor wages. On June 25th, a girl was fined sixpence by your Mr. Butler for dropping a tray. On June 23rd, another girl was fined sixpence by the same man for having left under her bench a few matches she had dropped. One child was fined sixpence for three weeks running. Pass the fines. Do you know that girls carry boxes on their heads till their hair is rubbed off? And so young heads are bald at 15 years of age. Let there rise up before you the pale, worn face of another man's 15-year-old daughter with wistful, pathetic, patient eyes and see her as she pulls off her battered hat and shows a head robbed of its hair by the constant rubbing of the carried boxes so that your dividends may be the larger. Five women workers, Mary Driscoll, Alice Francis, Eliza Martin, Kate Slater, and Jane Wakeling were suspected by the Brandon May management of being whistleblowers, tipping off the journalist Annie Besant about the terrible conditions and starvation pay in the factories, and three of them were dismissed. At once, 1,400 women workers walked out in protest, and a few days later, the factory had to stop production. The chairman told the shareholders... You were all pretty well aware of what this strike has arisen from. For a considerable time, agitation has been at work in the East End of London, tending to upset the minds of the workers. Sheila, I just love the idea that it is outside agitators who always mysteriously arrive when the elite and the capitalists and the government don't like something that's happening on the streets. It's never local people with a genuine grievance. It's always some mysterious outside agitator. So tell me, have you ever met an outside agitator? <laughs> well, I suppose I might have been suspected of being one. Because one. you <laughs> are one, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I, I think that... Uh, there was a, a, a the other thing too is this, the thing of saying that when there's a, a some kind of disturbance and um, people get arrested, then people locally all say, "Oh, it was those other people," and they they said that in the 18th century, and it was also something that came up in Hackney when there was riots in Hackney in the 70s. And early eighties, there was um, uh, immediately people in Hackney were saying they came from Brixton. They all came from Brixton. Twenty minutes on the three three eight bus, but it was true that strike action does spread. That people do learn from one strike to another, don't they, Sheila? Actually, at the same time as the Bryanton May, there are strikes all over the country, but they never got the publicity because. Um, there was a, a middle-class commentator who was writing about them in uh, London. They did inspire the idea of action in Bristol. Cotton workers in Bristol rebelled in a strike that's less well-known. It was a period when women workers were standing together for better wages and also for rights like the vote. The entire campaign of votes for women started with public demonstrations, and they were a bit like the old food riots in that sense of public disobedience and a sort of street theatre. And we saw that again in the 1970s in our lifetimes as women's liberation took up the public demonstration. There was a huge demonstration when women threw flower bombs and let off fireworks and disrupted the Miss World Beauty Parade at the Albert Hall. I was a girl at the time, but I remember the absolute fun of this, a sense that beauty queens and posing in swimsuits were so absolutely ridiculous, and the playfulness of the demonstration. Like the medieval women's protests were a sort of social theatre with music and with people, you know, maybe just banging saucepans, but sometimes with a flute or a pipe or something, that there's this thread of popular demonstration which is sort of party-like, like it's, it's fun, it's like a pantomime. Was that typical of the early women's liberation, Sheila? 
the very first demonstration was, you know, people dressed up and they did things and they sang um, songs and they were there was they were they were very theatrical in the very early stages because you had to break through and and people watching were surprised, really surprised to see that first demonstration of women in London. And because it was theatrical and joyous, they were all smiling, you know, because mm. and they felt this is something extraordinary. A protest that's really important in this story because it was exclusively women only is the 1980s Greenham Common Peace Camp trying to prevent the installation of American long-range nuclear warheads on what had been English common land. By 1982, there was a substantial camp at each of the airfield gates and they did all sorts of half-legal stunts. I remember them tying wool yarn all around the perimeter fence. Uh, and here's a journalist, Jane Corbyn, reporting on the camp for an ITN news report on Christmas Eve, 1982. This is one unseasonally bleak scene which has profoundly moved many people during 1982. No roaring log fires or gift-wrapped presents, just flimsy plastic tents, sodden sleeping bags and the endless mud. But the Christmas spirit is alive and well at the women's peace camp at Greenham Common. Their peaceful protest against the sighting of cruise missiles here is into its second winter, despite attempts to evict the women. They've been to prison for their beliefs, and their new style of politics based on emotion has spread to create other peace camps and boost the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Louise? I was at school, secondary school, when Greenham Common was, was happening, and it was really interesting that some of the mothers that went off to Greenham Common were actually very much the middle-class end of, of the kids in our school, and it was almost like a political fight if you see what I mean, as opposed to, you know, worrying about whether you can put food on the table or, you know, abortion or uh, choice and things like that. It, I thought at the time how weird it was that these women had gone off to Green and Common. Of course, they were on the news every night. We will reverse the decision, the NATO decision, to cite cruise missiles in Europe and we'll start winding back the whole nuclear escalation. That's what I think 1983 will mean and I think it's a really crucial year. Mrs Thatcher seems determined not to listen to you. Is all this worth it? All this is certainly worth it. After all, we've got, Mrs Thatcher's got to come to an election very, very soon. I think the nuclear issue is going to be one of the issues on which the election is decided. Sheila, was Greenham Common protest important to you? Did you recognise it as a unique expression of women's liberation in the 80s or was it kind of off on the side? No, it was It was very much part of a of strong feeling among women, particularly, I think, not so much the people like me who had been involved in both socialism and feminism through the, through the 70s, but a whole new group of um, women who became attracted to this cause, which they took in a, a very deep personal way. And because they, they felt it was in harmony with mothering and um, caring and nurturing. What do you say to the people that say you should be at home with your families at Christmas at this time of the year? I think they're right. And when I'm sure that we aren't going to have cruise missiles, then I will gladly go home and, and be with my family. But at the moment, I think that in order to create a possibility of a future for that family, I've got to be here working against the missiles. It's so interesting, isn't it, that there you have a woman explicitly making the connection between being a good wife and mother, as it were, at home, and her political action outside the home, outside. And, of course, the irony was that in the, the 70s, we'd been completely saying, we don't want to be stuck in this kind of role. So there was a bit of a turnaround for those of us who had been arguing we want to get out into all kinds of new areas that women have been not allowed into and start to rethink also whether there were particular values that are associated with being women. I mean, I'm still quite wary about that because I'm aware of how if you say it's, there's something that's particular to women, mm. you can get, in, to quote Simone de Beauvoir, enclosed in your own difference and then you get stuck again. But 
it's so important to have alternative values in a movement which is saying we want change. Because if you just say we're against the setup as it is, it's a much less strong position than having some idea of what you're actually wanting to put in its place. And there's a, there's a really wonderful connection here through time. One of the main things that women rioted against in the medieval world and later was the stealing of the common land from the villages. The big landlords took the common fields and the wastelands into their own estates. It was a massive land grab. The working people of England lost access to about a quarter of all the land available. And here at Greenham, the women's peace camp was able to survive because it was on common land all around the Air Force Base. Even today, women are at the forefront of protest, but it still seems to surprise people. Authorities don't like to see women protesting, women rioting, and when they meet female protest, it's as if they don't know what to do. Let's come right up to date now. There were such shocking scenes at the vigil for Sarah Everard, where the police faced hundreds of women grieving for a young woman who had been raped and murdered by an off-duty policeman. And they decided to prosecute the organisers for breaking COVID restrictions and arrest women. It was just one of those extraordinary moments that a young woman was abducted, raped, tortured and then murdered by a serving police officer, a firearms officer at that. And I found it and continue to find it rather extraordinary that rather than deal with the horror of that and what that meant for women in London and nationally, they treated a vigil as if it wasn't symbolic of something much greater. I think what Sheila said, what you've said is true, that there's something about a woman protesting which is deeply uncomfortable and they don't really know what to do about it. Why was this police so badly? Why didn't the police cooperate with the organisers of the vigil instead of declaring it illegal and trying to shut it down? Louise? I do not understand why they didn't. They, they, I know they considered it, but why didn't they field all women to that um, event? Why didn't they cooperate to see how they could facilitate it? Why did they literally put the drawbridge down and actually in many ways have actually set out to almost get and go for the women that originally decided to do it. And so, so I find it, it's almost like the authorities are affronted by women. I, I, think that's, I think that's what goes on. And I think that carries through to the present day. Do we really think there's no change now? I, I mean... I know the historian's curse is nostalgia. It's very easy to think that things were better in the past. But can it be true that despite all the advances made by women, there's a change in the present world of things actually getting worse for women, for women being less heard, for women's protests being less heard? Sheila? I mean, I, I think some ways women are much, you know, women, young women on the media are much more confident than my generation were. And they have a very strong sense of having the right to speak, I think. I mean, it's very difficult to describe how difficult it was to break through that barrier of just imperviousness. Yeah. Louise? I think what's interesting about what where I feel we are now is that rightly younger women believe that their voice should be heard, yet they're still in an operating environment that doesn't really want to hear them. Yes. And I think that will change. Mm. I hope to God it will change because actually you can't keep people down. But I think at the moment you've got a bit of a double whammy of kind of women being told, you know, we're going to end violence against women and girls as if that's... Yeah, you know, we can't even say we're going to end male violence against women and girls because everybody's worried about saying that about men. I think we've we've got a situation, I think, and I hope to God as we move into the mid 21st century, that that sort of standing on each other's shoulders as generation to generation, that they will push even further to be heard and to be seen. 
I think the problem now is that women have got places in those areas, but it's only individual women. And it's only when it's a collective movement of masses of women that you really can change that power structure. And the power structure isn't only between men and women, but between classes and mm. races too. So it, as our society has got more unequal, um, women have had to sort of duck and dive in between that so that individuals have come through, but not most women. Do you think that women will only ever be heard if they work together? Do we, and do we have to be very, very loud? Do women still need to riot? Where we are now in the 21st century, I don't know what the modern equivalent of rioting is, and I don't want people destroying shops and homes and things like that. There's no good in that. But peaceful, loud protest about the rights of women and the responsibility that we continue to bear for essentially a national issue of child destitution and hunger, I'd like us to see more action and more collaborative action for women. Thank you, Louise Casey. Sheila Rowbottom, thank you very much. In the next episode on the Normal Women podcast, Normal Women Are Angels, I'll be taking a closer look at how society kept ladies at home and I'll be joined by best-selling author Kate Moss and I'll spice up your life with Jerry Halliwell Horner. All of the themes explored in this series can be found in my book, Normal Women, 900 Years of Making History. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please tell the normal women in your life about it. Hope you'll be joining me soon. Normal Women, 900 Years of Making History, published by William Collins, is also available as an audiobook. There are links to both in the show notes. The Normal Women podcast was written and presented by me, Philippa Gregory, and features the voice talents of Claire Corbett, James Good, Melanie Gutteridge, and Rufus Wright, and includes original music composed by Juliet Pochin. The producer is Julia Johnson. The executive producer is Kate Ford, and sound design is by Tom Birchall. The commissioning editor for William Collins is Arabella Pike. I promise you that if you listen to the series, it will change the way you see everything. To hear all the episodes, including the one with Spice Girl Jerry Halliwell, go and follow the show wherever you're listening to me. And once you've tapped follow, don't forget to do the same for this show so you can find your next podcast. All my recommendations from the whole series will also be on Podcast Rex at www.podcastrex.com. That is podcastrex, R-E-X.com. <laughs>